So. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Wait, we have to do, we have to do, to start, before we start, we have to go like this. Okay. Want dat heb je toch nu doen? Dat heb ik net gedaan. Zal ik het nog een keer doen? Voor de derde keer, ja hoor. Oké. Okay. Met andere woorden, ik het leuk moeten. Hey. Oké, okay, sorry. Okay. Hello. Um, we're, you're listening and watching, uh, we're listening and or watching uh, Olave Talks. Uh, we're having an episode at the Black Archives with Jesse Abre, finally. It's been a while since we've been trying to meet up. Yes! <laughs> I'm so sorry. My no, don't be sorry. Busy life, busy life, busy life. Uh, what I always do before I start with the Olava Talks, I kind of explain a little bit what Olava Talks mm -hmm. is. So, very easy. Uh, Olava Talks is an initiative that I started about, a, about six months ago or so, in January. Uh, and Olava Talks is really a way for me to try to document and archive um, some of these amazing conversations that I've been having with uh, with activists, with feminists, with uh, trans people uh, in the last three years of my life. With uh, and I've just sort of sort of going through this process of awakening. I've met so many incredibly powerful, insightful people. And um, oftentimes I end up in conversations having these moments of great insights and going like, whoa, this was amazing, but having no way to record, to record that or to sort of document those mm -hmm. moments. So I figured that it would be really cool to start like an Olava Talks, like an archive, like a podcast slash vodcast um, that allows some of the people in my community to bear witness to the power of, of conversations as a method of knowledge production, but also as a method of knowledge transfer and using this medium as a way to archive that. So um, that's a little bit sort of the history and sort of philosophy of uh, Olava Talks. And I've been doing a lot of soul searching also this last couple of weeks about what, what, what kind of people I want to invite also more. And I think one of the things that is becoming clear to me that the Olava Talks, I hope is a safe space for um, a safe medium as well uh, for people who are doing incredibly important work uh, but who don't really have the room to uh, to you know who's who are framed in a particular way in media in in academia um, that I think sort of disembodies them that disembodies them and reduces them to a particular sort of philosophy or struggle um, to an agenda but not like you know so it doesn't give them room for their full humanity mm -hmm. so um, that's a little bit my, there's a bell ringing. <laughs> you have visitors, I think. We have to run out real quick, I think. Should I? Yeah, you should go, 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 check it out real quick. I'll explain a little bit more why I invited you as well. So, Olava Talks, it's, uh, it's messy, as you can tell, and we love it that way. That's how we like it. <laughs> uh, I've been thinking a lot about sort of the people I want to invite, and the people I want to invite are a lot like Jesse Abreu, who do, um, work that um, that is that is really controversial sometimes, and um, that has means a lot of sacrifices. That means a lot of um, a lot of. Uh, um, I'm just listening to what's happening. Important visitor. It's not even that important. Okay, <laughs> come sit down. For that. So I was just saying that I think you're one of the people that I wanted to invite because I've. I've sort of followed a little bit of the work that you've done for the last two or three years and it's incredibly powerful and important work um, but there has been also mechanisms that have come into play where dominant, um, dominant uh, uh, groups and the media has framed your work and your activism in a particular, in a particular way. For example, um, and that's where maybe where I want to start with you on is um, See, this is what happens this when you work <laughs> in a really small, small organization. Yeah. And you're doing like the grassroots work, but also the decision maker, the PR, yeah. sure. you're the secretary, you're everything. Yeah. So sorry. I. You can miss it in an interview. This was a big. No, but I thought you had a good idea. No, but I love this. This is the best year's Olaf Tans ever. Oh, um, oh cool. You can. And we're not cutting this out, just so you know. I love this. This is how grassroots organizations work yeah, indeed. Yeah, don't you will. Yeah. Just chill. <laughs> it's also quite special to be in this space, don't you think? Yeah. We were, we were sort of, uh, me and the camera people, very soon. Come, 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 say hi, come, say hi, come, say hi. Come, say hi. Come, say hi. Come, say hi. 
Yeah, this is Bearsuit who does all my camera and all the audio. No, the audio person is over there. Come down, come down. Okay. Come down, this is Fena. Hi, Fena. Hi. Thank you. Just come on. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but you were also very much struck by some of these items here, eh? right? You yeah. were being all like, wow, what the hell? Yeah, like you hear, uh, you hear about it, but it's another thing to actually like see it in, yeah. in real life. And, yeah. um, it's and not nice. Like it's not nice. Some of the books I've seen were disturbing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I will get to that. What I would like to ask about sort of like uh, uh, the Black Archives is like where where did y'all start this? Like how did this all oh, yeah. come about? Like you know to have collected so many very intense but also very important <laughs> artifacts. Yeah so how it all started we started as New Urban Collective. It was a student organization, a black student organization. Okay. Okay. Uh, basically students um, were scattered all around the university. Which university specifically? Free University. Okay. Um, where we realized that we, we were the only black person in class. Okay. So it tells much about the access to higher education. Mm -hmm. So in New York Collective, basically it was about carving that space mm -hmm. at the university to have those conversations, but also have a sense of feeling at home. Mm -hmm. um, but also having this conversation and looking for practical solutions. Mm. So Nurban Collective was founded in 2011 where we came together as black students, students of color, talking about these social issues mm. uh, that were affecting us and our society, basically our communities. Was, the, was the, those events and those conversations, were they facilitated by the university as well? No. Or was it entirely off the grid basically? No, Nurban Collective was never a part of it and like not institutionalized or integrated into the university okay. system we basically um just like took the room okay like, the, like literally like took the room the conference room or particular classes and we just had this conversation among black students and black young professionals mm. um however I, in 2011 was also the same moment that uh, Queen Sigario and Jerry Afrie were brutally arrested mm. for just wearing a t-shirt saying Swart to Peter's racism. So it did make a little bit, it had some, we were inspired by that moment. Okay. Also understanding that if you live in a welfare state as the Netherlands, it will tell you the idea that if you work twice as hard you will get there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, we did realize that despite that we have a university degree, it wouldn't save us from racism. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the connection that we make with, for instance, the movement that was started back then in 2011, that it's not just about university, it is about how the university is connected to a larger system of systematic yeah. racism. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, from there on, people are definitely inspired of understanding social mobility yeah. and that having that diversity talk, but also understanding the, the immense impact of grassroots and occupying public spaces yeah. and demonstration protests. That's really interesting because I have, I have also gone through uh, the Dutch uh, university system. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, I've studied in Maastricht and I studied in Leiden. I did my bachelor in Maastricht and I did my master in Leiden. And these are not necessarily the universities where you're gonna find people of color or black <laughs> people. This is really like if you're if you're black, young, and you're going, like, I would like to go to university. I would like to see some of my people as well at university. Maastricht and Leiden is probably not the place <laughs> you wanna go. Okay, <laughs> so you might wanna try free or something. Oh, Rotterdam. Of Haas Hogeschool. Yeah. yeah, Erasmus. Erasmus. Leiden, though. Pff. Anyways, but I remember though. And I think I was complicit in that as well. But I remember um, in a lot of the young professional black people that I was meeting, whether it was at the university or through uh, other sort of affiliations, uh, you know, uh, 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 student project, debate things and so on. Um, and in my research, especially in the law faculty, I remember, the, and I was complicit in it as well, eh? but I remember those were not necessarily the places where you found people with a very critical, uh, you know, sort of system, system, uh, uh, um, you know, I didn't think we were questioning very much. I think a lot of us just wanted to get the job, wanted to get, eh, if I look back at mm -hmm. what I was meeting, wanted to get the job, wanted, I mean, at some point, like I started off wanting to be like a social uh, justice lawyer, social, like, 
sort of more like uh, uh, doing things like criminal law, doing things like refugee law and so on. And I ended up as a corporate law master degree. You know, like <laughs> I ended up working for two years at a law firm where we were suing African countries for European companies. You know what I mean? Like there's this, there's mm -hmm. this, there's this trajectory I was on where basically I was sort of pursuing the neoliberal dream. And, and I wonder sometimes um, whether a lot of these sort of uh, discussions that we're having um, as young black professionals, sometimes whether they are critical enough and whether it isn't about gaining, you know, for example, I, I was hanging out with a lot of people of color back then. Mm -hmm. My queerness was, I couldn't come out. Mm. I couldn't come out to these people that were like, we were like fighting racism together at the university, right? But I couldn't come out as queer, you know? There was no feminist sort of critique or analysis. There was no, and if it was racial, it was mostly about like, why am I not allowed to do, but it wasn't like sort of, there wasn't a lot of solidarity with refugees, for example. There wasn't a lot of solidarity with poor people living in, 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 in the Balmer or something, mm. or in, in, in Maastricht, I don't know what, what neighborhoods. You know, but like there was none of that. It was mostly like, I want to get a job at Shell. Why can I not get a job at Shell? Definitely. You know, <laughs> and I wonder about that. Like, what happened? How do you go from? And I don't know what the view is very different. Yeah. To like being sort of like the Black Archive self organization. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you? What's the? There must be a process. Yeah. So I was also also wondering in your process. Yeah. <laughs> what was the turning point of what? But. So for when I speak about the Urban Collective, I tell my own story. So this mm. is so 2011 inspired me, mm. and I was part of um, of when the New Urban Collective was founded. Um, so I can only tell it from my own perspective and how it sees. So I understood that university would not save us mm. from racism, and having that shell job makes us part of the problem. Yeah. Um, so how did we get into more, an, I would guess, an intersectional mm -hmm. analysis? Uh, it took me some while. Maybe also, I don't know how you experience yourself, but I understood feminist politics, but I wouldn't, back that time, I wouldn't call myself a feminist because mm -hmm. I was not known with the language. Mm -hmm. Which also comes back to what I think is a, a very important um, analysis in intersectionality often neglected is the factor of class mm. so class in my experience is also having the access to information knowledge etc so i didn't call myself a feminist until i went to university and saw gender analysis mm -hmm. and then understood something like intersectionality but if you would say intersectionality to the working class people they would say what's that oh, so yeah. <laughs> but at the same time they do have the lived experience yeah. of intersectionality I think it's an important conversation to have when we have when we analyze being black and fighting racism, how it's intersected with a different system of oppression. But often what I see is that when I work among um, among communities is that they didn't have access to a particular knowledge and information mm. and lived experience. Um, and we really need to, well, it should not be everybody's child, but that is what I try to carry for myself or for other people to have those difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Like, you are a great feminist, but you're not an anti-racist, mm -hmm. or you are an anti-racist, but not a good feminist, mm -hmm. or you're being really heterosexist or yeah. transphobic at this moment. Yeah. So, yeah, we still need a lot of work through that. But even when you're black and educated, this that doesn't mean that they have access to that knowledge, which also brings us to a large system of mm -hmm. whiteness that do does a, such a system in power really want us to know those things. Mm -hmm. Because if we want, if we have those information, what makes us capable to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and I was, I was, um, you know, like you, you, you do the Black Archives now. Uh, with Michelle and with Miguel, yeah, and um, there was an inspiration that came from uh, the kind of the kind of like uh, activism that was happening in two thousand eleven, right? And 
and now you're 2018. So two, mm -hmm. Like seven years have gone by. Yeah. And I'm very curious, like, how did you go from that space of being sort of like uh, uh, inspired by what's happening on the streets, you know, <laughs> the police violence against black bodies, activist bodies, to like having set up something as unique in terms of also historically, right, uh, for the Netherlands as a black archives? I think, I, I'm not sure, I think people already started archives, I guess. Okay. Because you, I wouldn't say that we are the first, maybe one of the first. Okay. And I guess we're Black not, archives, like sort of black centers. Yeah, until I'm not sure, I don't want to claim that. Like, okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I yeah, say yeah. one of yeah. the first, of course. Um, mm -hmm. But how did it all start? This New Urban Collective was this black organization, um, black student organization where we understood that the problems do not begin and end with the university mm. but a lot of stuff that we faced when we go to our education actually started when we were in primary school mm. at the pseudo exam mm. so a lot of the students at New Urban Collective were under advised mm. means that they had a high score but they were still sent to lower levels of education mm -hmm. so understanding that experience we also work with uh, at 10, 11, 12 year olds. Oh, yeah. yeah, we have a mentoring program, which is actually cool. You should. <laughs> I've I've seen a few of the of the of the, the facatures, the, the mentor. Uh, yeah, and I've thought about, but I live in The Hague, and yeah, um, and I would no. love to because I think it would be really really cool. And if you ever want to set one up in The Hague, let me know because I think there are a lot of kids who could benefit from that. We can definitely support yeah. in you know experiences and looking for resources and you know, having that conversation. Mm. But it's important for us to work with those children because that moment is a crucial moment in our Dutch educational system. Mm. Take that, um, New Urban Collective Student Organization, we work with children, but after university, the racism and discrimination does not end. Mm. So if you look into the numbers, data, and statistics, there is still discrimination on the labor market. Mm -hmm. So we also work with, for instance, um, organization, business and companies where we do have those talks about diversity. Now think about it, where does the black archives fill in those gaps is to understand that the conversation that we have today, when you look into the career path of people of color in the Netherlands, that it's not a new debate, but we have those yeah. conversations for years, for yeah. decades, for centuries. Yeah. And the black archives is basically saying, okay, we can look at this from a historical perspective mm -hmm. and maybe gain more insights. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also really interesting because when I was at university, um, the, the the library, the Masters Library, Law of Library, literally like had very little sources. Like I don't ever really even remember really quoting black people, like referencing mm -hmm. black people in my studies, <laughs> because there was just no. It wasn't part of the curriculum. It wasn't part of the of the of the of the of the knowledge that was considered relevant or important. And I wonder whether there has been, um, in setting this up, in starting this up, has there been a conscious sort of, uh, a, like sort of, has it, is it a counter reaction also to the lack of, you know, black uh, knowledge and black inspired, black generated, Definitely. you know, is there part of it? Definitely. So part of it is um, the Black Argus was founded in 2015, where we started with a small book collection of Waldo Heilbronn, who, mm. who worked at the uh, University of Amsterdam, did critical analysis on Dutch history, slavery, race, colonialism. Um, from there on, um, we had to move to here in 2016, where the book collection basically grew further. Mm. So now we have four book collections on race, colonialism, um, and its intersections. Um, so the reason why we did that is because at the time of 2011 till 2015, there was no deep analysis on the stuff that was going on around Swarte Piet. Mm. And we knew that it's because the story of the colonial past, slavery, and how it still affects us today, mm. is, not th is not taught at university at educational level. Yeah. So we wanted to contribute of making that knowledge, information, history accessible to the public. Um, what I think I wanted to contribute to that concept, to the idea that we can contribute of uh, making that knowledge accessible to understand that when we always talk about colonialism, slavery and etc. Um, I, want, I want my own community and also communities outside that to understand that 
in the history of slavery and colonialism, there was always resistance. Mm. Mm. And that is what the Black Argus is about, that there, it was always about resistance, and it is an res act of resistance, yeah. of not only telling about there is a colonial past, and you can see um, physically that how much knowledge it is about it, so mm. nobody can say that there is nothing written about it. But we also named the book collection after the, don the, don uh, the donateurs, mm. so after the Helbron, Glenn Willems, uh, Otto Huiswoud, Vereniging Ons Suriname, to understand that in the whole debate about black writers, there are black writers and um, they have contributed to knowledge, yeah. to science, yeah. um, and specifically also talking about black Europe, that yeah. there are people of African descent in Europe yeah. who contributed to that, and that mm. we not only look to the UK or to the US. Yeah. And that, that, that thing is really interesting as well. I, wanna, I have two questions for you, just, and I don't want to forget them, so you can answer them yeah. in what I want to... So the first one is about um, sort of like who come, who because it's here now, mm -hmm. so who's coming? Who's coming to come and read the stuff, to use it, to uh, research it, to reference it? Who's, who, you know, because it's here now. You know, mm -hmm. is it is it univer are universities students coming in drones? Are professors coming? Are uh, are <laughs> local sort of people trying to figure out the history is coming? Like what what's happened? I'm curious about that. That's How the first works, question. Yeah. The second question. I'm also interested in the black because I'm in the in the 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 the, 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 the name black archives. I'm mm -hmm. I'm Burundian descent, mm -hmm. and um, and I wonder like uh, as a as a sort of Afro European person. Um, there is a particular sort of history of writing that is uh, both on the continent, yes, there are like Burundian uh, uh, scholars who have come and written about about Burundi, about culture, you know, they've done, you know, sort of like, uh, 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 sort of they've come and been integrated in the system here and they've been taught to think in particular ways about, about Africa. But there's also writings from back home, from Burundi, from uh, from the East Africa, from West Africa, from you know about the struggles, and I wonder, um, is that is that part of the mission? Is it be like of of the Black Archives? Does it include that blackness as well? Mm -hmm. And and how? Because I can imagine that that's also very hard to get access to, to find it and to integrate it. To, to. Uh which narrative exactly? For example, for example, the the, 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 the local sort of like the, the local realities of colonized people yeah, yeah. in Africa, for example. Definitely. Yeah. And I mean even say in Suriname or in yeah. the Caribbean, like I'm pretty sure it's really hard to find uh, those those works as well there. Yeah. You know, like that, that to, not only what happened here, what people wrote in this context, in the Afropean context. Yeah, yeah. anyways. Those so, are my two questions. <laughs> yeah, so let's start with the name Black Argives. So one thing, if you notice, is English. Mm. Uh, nobody actually really questioned it, but the reason why I chose it to be English because if you put it in Dutch, um, the conversation will not get that much mm. nowhere. Um, so I liked it to be, first of all, accessible to international communities, but mm. also because I think the debate on race and how we construct race in the Netherlands is just underdeveloped and mm. people wouldn't get it. Mm. So I want to start with a broad community and mm. from there on I just put my standards high so this is the conversation, the, this political conversation we're going to have. Second thing is, is that the Black Archives is not um, static. Mm. It's about um, basically, it's we call it community archiving. Mm. Well first we did this uh, with volunteers so this room looks neat now, but it was actually full with hundreds of boxes mm. that we unpacked it and realized that there was much more history to it than we understood. Mm. Um, so community archiving is one, working with volunteers, but that, it, that is actually built with communities. Mm. So the Waldo Heilbronn collection is at the back of my, of my chair. Um, that was the first donation, that is his picture actually there in the corner. Oh. Yeah, so that's the first donation. Uh, Miguel Halbrun uh, is his son, uh, Chema Halbrun too. And the idea was quite popular that um, other uh, families decided also to donate their okay. dad's books. So for instance, Glenn Willemse, so his books are right up there. So his daughter also gave his books to us to say we want to make this history accessible. 
Okay. Yeah. yeah, so the Black Archive is not something static. It is actually about um, complexities, mm -hmm. uh, diversity. Black stands for um, people of African descent, mm -hmm. supporting uh, our own communities, because we, the history of slavery and history affected us, so we know this history, it is close to us, so therefore we want to speak about it. Mm -hmm. It's just the history that we are closest to. So people of African descent are at the center at its intersections. Mm -hmm. But black also stands for marginalized stories and narratives where people um, cannot have those conversations in other institutions. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hope that when they come here, they do feel seen, they do see the identity, they do see the history or the lack of that history mm -hmm. um, here. So it stands for people of African descent and everybody who can engage with soortgelijke geschiedenissen, mm. with uh, similar histories, uh, but also how those histories are intersected, mm. um, but also about those marginalized narratives. And the Black Archives also stands for, um, like I said, not static, but something that is always growing and changing. Growing and and changing. Yeah. So for instance, the Black Archives, actually all of our four collections were made were named uh, after men, mm. but if it was not, I think, for myself, then for instance, the Otto Huiswoud <laughs> book collection would have been called <laughs> Otto Huiswoud book collection, but now it's called Hermina and Otto Huiswoud yeah. because simply also because a lot of the books in there belong to Hermina. Yeah. So if it was not for myself as a black woman to understand the power dynamics and how women in particular are silenced, black people are silenced, and to have that intersection. Yeah. Therefore, I gave it to Hermine or the Huiswell book collection. Yeah. And hopefully in the future, then people will constantly add to the diversity of what it means to be black. Yeah. So it's constantly about adding stuff. It is not never a static thing, but something that should be growing and understanding what it means to live in those, in those, mar in those margins, but understanding also when you even live in those margins, you can still be further marginalized. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that we always need to keep our eyes open for those dynamics. But to have, for instance, in particular, people of African descent at the center and those intersections. Yeah. Nice. Hij doet opgeschreven. Dat is een great mission statement. That is the manifest of the Black Archives manifest. So that's how we break it down. Uh, who's coming? So who's coming to the Black Archives? Yeah. It's not even. And what are they doing? That's a good question. So. The Black Art Guys, uh, what I always want to challenge within the concept of inter intersectionality, because we are a lot focused on um, gender, sexuality, and other uh, intersections. But what always faced us, what makes this different identity the hardest, mm -hmm. is class. Okay. And class, I think, we neglected that in our analysis, because it's hard to grasp. Mm -hmm. and, the, and class also changed through times. Yeah, I'm sure. So, for instance, if you would have the theory of bourgeois for people who are from the academics, mm. class is cultural capital, like you go to museums, mm. social capital, the people that you know. But class it means also how do you gain access. It's about access. Mm. So you can think about the Black Art Guys having all of these books, but also understand that working class people might not always have uh, the money to read books, mm. but also not always have the time to read the books. Time, yeah because sometimes you just have to work to feed your children and pay your rent, etc. So I can totally understand it, but we have to find ways to make knowledge accessible. So yeah. we do all of these events constantly. Um, we wanted to make it in that sense accessible. For instance, we did the exposition. Mm -hmm. It was only five euros to attend, mm -hmm. um, where people can uh, read about Otto and Hermina Huiswoud um, within an hour. Mm -hmm. So we did that first in exposition, then wrote a book about it first for hundred pages to make it accessible. So we always think about accessibility. So that is what I wanted to bring at the Black Art Guys. To come to the last part about who really comes here, unfortunately, what I think is pretty sad is that we often get a lot of mails from researchers mm. and university and academics, which I think is a good thing, but the constant state is, is that People of color are overrepresented in lower levels of education mm -hmm. and underrepresented in higher levels of education, which makes the university and academics really white. Mm. So I do understand the interest and also people want to contribute on making knowledge accessible. 
at the same time we should as in they want to come and curate no like going to the art guys mm -hmm. and for their research okay. but the trick about it is is that um how do we how do we make sure because this is the first vision of the black art guys how we are always part when they wrote about colonial history and mm -hmm. colonial um about the colonial past about slavery white people always wrote about us mm -hmm. but not with us yeah um yeah so how do we make sure that we can write our own history yeah. so that is the only thing that i fear of is that um let me say i want to keep a good eye and that black people can write their own history and that they are not over shadowed mm. by other communities who have more access yeah so i want yeah. black people to write their own histories and do their own research you don't have to be from academics to do your research actually yeah. you do okay not. that's a good one that's a really good one because i think um of course some of the so the way that the, the academia and, and and white institutions sort of dominate um knowledge production mm -hmm. is this sort of uh, uh, this epistemological hierarchies, like who, not only what is relevant knowledge, yeah. uh, what is what is real knowledge, like it has to be in a book, it can't be oral stories, for example, that's not real literature, that's like just people talking behind the, uh, mm. at the fire, at the fire, um, uh, oh, and who, right, so which accreditations does somebody have, which university they belong to, methodology, you know, so like, um, you know, what kind of, um, like if you're going to come and analyze this, you can't, so it's not real knowledge if you, for example, make a work of, work of art of it. No, you have to make it a sort of like a, a, a PhD proposal. It has to be mm. specific. There's a lot of these epistemological hierarchies. And I think what I find interesting is to sort of uh, uh, how archives like this, institutions like this, um, like how can you be critical about who comes? Like how do you sort of un undo these hierarchies? Like who comes, who has access indeed, yeah. you know? And what do they, like, how can you sort of encourage different mediums, different epistemological sort of methods, and, and, and how do you give it back to the community so they can do with it with what they want with it, you know, instead yeah. of like, and that can be tricky, I think, right? You're using, a, like, really large words. Am I? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I understand what you're going to. Basically, it's about... Um, no, understanding those different audiences and uh, understanding that the knowledge that is here yeah. how is it relevant to these different communities yeah. and I understand that and how do they get access to it and yeah. what can they what can they how do we how do we make sure that what they do with it mm -hmm. you know whether for example their students doing um, 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 I don't know uh, reports mm -hmm. or whether they are uh, artists who find things here and they and that inspires them and they write or they sing about it or whether it's I don't know people in the community who are inspired to do an event and have a dialogue or conversation about colorism for example you know mm -hmm. um, how as an archive can you help can you be directive in the way these different ways of working with knowledge, creating knowledge, and archiving knowledge, can you be sort of directive in what happens with it and so on? Is that possible? I think it's so. Well, it's you have you, at the end if you're if it's possible or not possible, it's a responsibility. Mm. So I feel it's a responsibility. Um, so I do think keep in mind who has access, who does not have access, and. It's really simple. I really want people to know about their own history. Yeah. That's that's the really for me the thing, and I'm I'm concerned in how what other different way what other different ways to to have knowledge transfer. So you can have like the black art guys and having all of these documents and books. That's one thing you can mm -hmm. read them. We do also events. Now we do expositions, yeah. but we are further developing in how can we transform knowledge and. Um, and you've invited artists to do things with, uh, for example, Iris Kensmail. Oh, yeah. That was amazing. Like, it was so interesting to see yeah. that, to be, that to be a way to make it accessible. Yeah, so that's the reason why we also work with artists. Yeah. <laughs> because um, I think one of the things that people often f forget is that art has an, had a huge role in social change. If you mm. look into history, they something that's sort of be as racism. Yeah. That's a really, you know an important moment in our generation mm. and how art has huge influence in that um, 
Yeah, so we work with Ada Skinsmill, Raoul Balai, Brian mm -hmm. Elstock, and we basically gave these artists the freedom to say, make your interpretation mm -hmm. of the history of Otter Hermine Huiswald. And what I think is nice is that it really contributed to, uh, I, I think it's the first time I'm actually speaking on this. I, they had, had a great uh, contribution to the exposition. So take the work of uh, Brian Elstock, where we portrayed um, um, Otto Huiswald, Hermine Huiswald, but also W.E. Du Bois, who was here mm -hmm. because of oh. Otto Hermine. Oh, okay. They were in Amsterdam, but W.E. Du Bois is portrayed with Shirley, with his wife. Mm. Uh, Marcus Garvey portrayed with Amy. To me, it's quite important. So mm. I'm a heterosexual woman um, that, yeah, we are not always, um, how you say that, we're not always. Uh, Black seeing black love is really scarce. Yeah, it's very scarce. And, and yeah. every and black radical love, like people <laughs> who are black who are fucking radicals. And like, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I I I, I did also for Brian Elsa who made who did a mention that I thought black love was really important because mm -hmm. during colonial history we are taught not to love ourselves. Yeah. So how can we love each other if you don't even love yourself? Yeah. So every time I look into the television or Netflix or whatever, you always see these interracial couples, mm. which I think is a huge, you know, I think it's important, but to always see that to love each other always has to involve a white person, I think is also problematic. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I think interracial love is, you know, it's like part of it, but it shouldn't be part of the narrative that then we have overcome race. Precisely. Yeah. So I think that's part of what I want to contribute in black people seeing black people in love but also with each other yeah. thank the work of Erik Kensmel who made a very strong relationship with Otto Huiswald from the 60s to 2000 something with Swarte Piet mm. uh, I love, love that history that sort of way that she just makes it all connected <laughs> I love that yeah yeah and now the old Belay did the same with his video installation where you see actually Naomi Peter and I mm -hmm. who were both arrested yeah. during the protest uh, and you see Otto Huiswald also walking through our yeah. jail bars. Yeah. Um, and then he made a nice wall, because Raoul Belay did our main design, but also did the art pieces on the wall, mm. where you can see that Otto Huiswald and Mina Huiswald were followed by the Dutch FBI, but also by the oh, American wow. okay. FBI. So they were followed at both sides of the ocean. Yeah. They, were, they were a threat, yeah. because they were not only black, but they were black in resistance, and they yeah. were communist. And yeah. they were, you know, they were fighting for international solidarity. So I think it's interesting how you're talking about sort of this, this uh, your, your uh, um, I wouldn't say your only contribution, but definitely your feminist contribution to sort of like, uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, centering Hermina instead of like it be, being just Ota Heisbaud and talking about how you, your, your role as an archivist and as a curator um, as a woman becomes, and I'm curious because I remember you talked once we briefly met like en passant at this museum in the south of the Netherlands and you talked about, you suddenly said the word the politics of archiving and I was like what is this thing? Tell me about it! All of oh my god! And I think one of the things you said was about how we think of at least uh, uh, archivers are invisibilized. They're anonymous, they're mm -hmm. neutral, they're considered as sort of some neutral people. We don't know who they are, they just decide things and, and, and they decide what is important, what is not important, and, 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 and but we don't know who they are and they're not questioned, their positionality is not questioned, right? Yeah. And that was a really great insight. Okay. Tell well, me more about that. But actually, I learned that from, a, I learned that actually from a, uh, from my colleague. Mm. So, when you think about archives, mm -hmm. you think about these large institutions, but not always, not think about the labor behind it. Mm -hmm. So if you look into archives, somebody did it. Yeah. And so the archivist becomes a visible person. Mm -hmm. We don't know who is or what it is. So why, why there is a lot of power into archives? Because they systematically put in place how historical facts have been. Mm -hmm. So it's not the historian mm -hmm. we think it has a lot of power. The mm. historians have to go intro this, into these facts mm. first. Yeah. So the archivist basically may, often has a little bit more power than the historian because they order the historical facts mm. for the historian to have their 
yeah, yeah. the resources. What is interesting in that same museum, um, there's a there's a painting that they think is very important that was mm. bought very very early on into the history of this museum. It's the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven. I'm doing a research residency there. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the paintings that they have there in their permanent collection is a painting by a black boxer called Kid Oliveira. Mm -hmm. He was painted by a um, by by white painter like uh, from I think from this from Brabant. Mm -hmm. And uh, the painter himself titled the painting with a Kid Oliveira between brackets boxer. That's it. Turns out that sometime along the way of having purchased the piece and, and archiving it, that someone had decided, and we don't know who this person is, but we can presume it was a white male person, but mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, decided to change the title of the piece in the archives, and also, so uh, not on the painting itself, but so in the archives and in the titles that they were, mm -hmm. when they were... The labeling. Yeah, the labeling to uh, a portrait of a nigger. Yeah. Protect from the Neger. Yeah. And so till 2001, no, or 2006, in the 2000s, um, it was used like that and it was borrowed to other, uh, was it, when it was also like put on, 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 on display, we presume that it was named Het Neger Portrait. Um, we find in the archives at some point, 2001, 2006, that someone decided to change the title back uh, from Portrait of an Edward to Kid Oliveira between brackets, boxer. There's no explanation. There's no. We tried to like uncover what happened, and we talked to the person with whom we found the, for once that we see the name of, and this person says uh, is not the head of college. He's like I don't really remember. I think it might have been a uh, a a, 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 a um, museum that like that had borrowed it that might have noticed the discrepancy between on the back of the on the back of the mm -hmm. of the of the painting the the title that the painter himself had put there and the label that he might have gone like wait a minute but this and they might have actually done an analysis to see whether it was really the handwriting of the painter and that therefore it was changed not necessarily out of political consideration but purely out of historical accuracy because that was the name of the title of the painter yeah and so this person doesn't remember and said in fact if I had not if I had if you if I had seen this um, in passing in the museum um, I might not, just the name of the title the, the old Edward yeah. portrait uh, thing I might not even think of it as a problem I and mean, they were very grateful that I had said why that was a problem but it's like the white person says I don't think I would have even noticed that it was a problem so we find also in some of the uh, 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 transportation uh, bills that they were still referring to it inside, internally, they were still referring to it as the N-word portrait until 2006 or so. And, uh, and so, I'm, so this invisibility of the archivists yeah. is indeed, because for a very long time, that was the official title, that was the, the name of the portrait, apparently. It's really simple how we can how we can uh, make the archivist visible. Um, so in the Black Archives, we I'm trying to also think about new ways of archiving. Mm. Um, how it always how you can always make it flexible. So you can always add. That was one thing. Mm. But what I definitely learned is is because the archivist is so invisible. Why not archive the archivist's choices? Yeah. So who was the archivist and why made you make particular choices? It yeah. makes it interesting. So people can actually follow what actually happened yeah. with the portrait of Kit Oliveira and who made it and why did you make those choices? Yeah. Ah, it's tricky. I agree but with you. Really I, I suggested it at some point to someone and they were like, because you told me, yeah. and they were like, whoa, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to really sort of, um, but I think for, for, for the Black Archives, I'm then curious. Um, like what indeed these new ways of, of archiving that you talked about also mm -hmm. before to me. Um, I wonder whether, because I think you, you create sort of metadata, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have the data, you have the documents that mm -hmm. become facts, that become mm -hmm. part of the way that we create, so sort of how we mem remember things. Yeah, and metadata are the titles yeah. for people, metadata. <laughs> oh, shit, I bet they fine. <laughs> but 
but also this archivist. So then, then the the archive itself becomes sort of a historical yeah. artifact, a document. Yeah. It's something that we can trace how have people that the attitudes have been of the archive and the people working there. What have their attitudes? I think it's really brilliant. Yeah, I I hope that the archive. What's nice about the black archive is never finished. Mm. It can always grow. Yeah. How much we space we want to take. Yeah. And it should be done by different people. So I really want to leave it open also, for instance, so Vereniging on Suriname, which will exist next year for 100 years. Vereniging on Suriname wow. is the building where we are in now. Um, it already says in the name, it's about the Surinamese communities, but there were also different other communities. So it is the Black Archive is not static, it's about having a conversation. Mm. And people are able to fill those in. So every person who donates here becomes the archive, the archive former. Mm -hmm. So you develop that archive, so you also give name to that archive. Yeah. So it makes also people part of knowledge production. Yeah. Can can artists who are making new works right now? Yeah. Can they come and bring their works to be archived by uh, Black Archives? I was thinking about working and so I work also at an art institution mm -hmm. where I see how they the archive artist. Mm -hmm. I really do want to make it also part of our vision that art has been taken away from us, so mm -hmm. it's seen as a middle class, upper class activity mm. but unfortunately a lot of our people black people people of color are driven forced into poverty mm. so we really have to reclaim it back yeah. art, because it belongs to us yeah. so i wanted to make an important factor that art belongs to us and part art sh should belong to the black art guys also yeah. that would be really way cool. of doing so yes because i see a lot of people doing amazing things yeah whether they whether they're poets or whether they are writers whether they yeah. are uh, makers and so on and I'm sure that they must have documentation of their processes and their outcomes you know yeah. and that could be something that perhaps they could make sure that right now we can sort of have uh, these living archives already not just in the past but also yeah. Yeah. Archive, I would definitely yeah there's actually already one there is one here yeah, already I found okay. out yesterday okay because Vereniging on Suriname is consisted also of different other organizations well it says it's for 100 years mm -hmm. And uh, downstairs we have the exposition belongs to Galerie Nola Hatterman. Okay. And uh, one of the women of Vereniging on Suriname is already archived uh, Surinamese black artists in her... Mm. In her... Uh, she doesn't... She's she probably, brilliant! She wouldn't even call it the archive, she said this is not archive. I said, yeah, but it, it might be inspiring yeah. for my generation. Yeah. Who do not see a lot of artists of color. Yeah. So there is actually already one. That's brilliant! But it's only archived from Galerie Nola Hatterman, but... I definitely want to contribute in. I really want to make our our people see in. in I, so the reason why I am become an activist because I didn't see my own vision. Therefore, mm. I decided to spoke because I'm actually really shy. Yeah. <laughs> and public speaking is not my activity, but I didn't hear my voice. So basically, I really kicked myself into patriarchy. Yeah. <laughs> because the movement was quite, you know, was really male dominated, but I really kicked myself in. I do not represent all narratives, let me mm. say that on forth. And then, yeah, just, I really want to support people to develop, to mm. organize, to mobilize. If you don't see yourself, if you don't hear yourself, we really have to develop our own. So if there is in the future like five more black art guys, I'm happy to, to know that. Yeah, yeah. I think there's space for it. I think there's a lot that we need to archive. Because I think part of the mechanisms of, 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 of forgetting us, of erasing our contributions to world history, to, um, to resistance, to uh, these nation-building projects that we see, whether they are Dutch, European, or otherwise, um, a lot of it has had to do with sort of keeping us out, out of archives. Part of forgetting us and erasing us is definitely not including us mm -hmm. into what is what is fact, right? Like what you said, mm -hmm. which is really fast, but what is uh, what is known, what was done, what was said. And uh, and I think, you know, like, this is a really great, um, a really great project. It's a good beginning, definitely. And I hope other people are inspired, other people are inspired, whether it's in the Netherlands, but also, you know, outside of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. 
are inspired to not wait for some, you know, uh, college degree archive specialist, whatever, no. to take it up. Or, I'm not an archivist. Yeah, you know, <laughs> for people to say, we think that's important, where, where, you know, and just sort of start saving and collecting. I think also private collections can be a very important. Definitely. I try to keep my books as much as possible. The books that I read or the things that I write, like, so, you know, with this, for example, to sort of make an archive of it, and by putting it online and mm -hmm. you know because the internet is forever mm -hmm. they say <laughs> um it's i think that's 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 i and i have to say that like, black archives was one of my inspirations to do to do olava talks really? so yeah it really was because again like i keep i keep every art everyone i say i want to make a living archive and i got that idea from seeing the uh, black archives happening i was like yes i want to right now start making documents, making artifacts, quote unquote, of what we're talking about now. And yeah. what we what we care about, what we're sort of dealing with. And not because I was everywhere I was saying black guys. Oh cool. Oh, okay. So it's quite an honor to have talked to you. Well we're it's done. an honor to be talking to you because you did an amazing job on activists. I follow your stories, your post oh. um, <laughs> everything. So I, I truly admire because there's one thing to talk about anti-racism but it's the second thing that I I truly admire of people is to go on the streets mm. I truly admire that mm. because not a lot of people feel safe to do that yeah. not a lot, a lot of people have time to do it oh. sometimes they fear the social economic position for their jobs etc well. they fear to be arrested um, but to also quote a really good friend of mine is like Although we were arrested, we never felt free. Yeah, more, more free than ever. So I remember sitting in Gouda when we were arrested with uh, with sort of Pete, uh, mm -hmm. with the uh, with. Um, remember Gouda, like mm -hmm. the intocht. I remember sitting in this little bus for eight hours long, with this activist I'd never met in my life before. They just put us together in this bus. We were being arrested. <laughs> we had the greatest conversation. It was the <laughs> best. I was like, "You're my buddy for life. You still hang out now." <laughs> Police person. <laughs> I have the same story because you know Knoll with Peter. Yeah, yeah. So I never no. knew about the. Oh, it's, it's almost that. We're we're done. We're done. We're done. We're almost. Sorry. Yeah, but just go to tell me this Naomi story. Naomi story. So I know Naomi. I recently got a, a note to know a Naomi in 2016 in Rotterdam, and 200 people got arrested. Yeah. But the reason why I did not get arrested in 2014 because Naomi, I didn't know she was Naomi. She, a girl ran to me. She said. They gonna lock us in. Oh, come now, come now. That's smart. We did. I didn't realize that that's what they were going to do. She said to me, "Come now." So I ran, and oh. then they all locked us in. And then two years later, me and Naomi were like, "Hey, I'm <laughs> She saved me for my, you know. Eventually, they got arrested in 2016, but it was it's kind of funny that I didn't know her back then. Yeah, that, I met a lot of really cool people because of Kikata uh, for Peter. Yeah, like, I just the really activists and sweet and stuff. people. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. You so yes. <laughs> ah, okay, I might invite you again because I feel like we haven't talked about all the things we could talk about, right? Like there's still so much we could talk about. 